Hello and welcome to our webcast titled The New Era of Digital for Coal-Fired Power. I'm your host, Matt Grant, publisher of Power Magazine. For everyone in the audience, uh, your screen should be refreshing, but if not, please uh, do feel free to do a manual refresh uh, so that you can see the presentation live on your computer. For today's program, we will hear from Kelly Borgen with Westar Energy and Peter Kirk with GE. Kelly Borgen graduated from Kansas State University with concurrent bachelor's and master's degrees in biological systems engineering. In 2012, she began working as an environmental engineer responsible for air emissions compliance at Westar Energy's Jeffrey Energy Center, which actually won the Power Water Award in 2014. Over time, her role has expanded to include plant performance and heat rate in order to promote a more holistic approach to emissions control. Peter Kirk was the president and CEO of NUCO in 2010 prior to its acquisition by GE in 2016. Peter's previous experience at NUCO included VP of Sales and EVP Business Development. Prior, Peter held roles as Business Development Manager with Plug Power Inc., a developer of stationary fuel sales, and as a developer, consultant, and banker with the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, Enron Development Corporation, and J.P. Morgan Chase, formerly Chemical Bank. Peter has an MBA in finance from Wharton and an MA in economics, energy, and environmental studies from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. This presentation will last about 50 minutes, and we'll follow up with the Q&A portion. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few housekeeping items. At the left of your screen, there's an area where you can type and submit questions to the speaker. Feel free to send in questions at any time during the presentation, and we will try to answer as many as time allows following the program. If you're experiencing any technical difficulty, you can also type that problem in the same area at the left of your screen, and our production staff will assist you. This program is available for download, and you can access a PDF of the slides under Event Resources at any time via this live studio link. It will be archived on our server, and future reviewing will remain free of charge. You can use the same URL to reach the archive program as you did to reach the live program. A certificate of completion for professional development hours will be sent out via email to every registered participant who attends. And before we begin, we would like to thank GE for underwriting today's program. Their generosity allows everyone to attend the presentation at absolutely no cost. So with that, I will turn the program over to Peter Kirk. Peter, take it away. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, and thank you all for attending. Uh, I am going to push through to, uh, well, I think I do need to pause and just point out the forward-looking statements and GAP uh, standard language. That's not something we did a lot at NUCO, but uh, very happy to do it here uh, at GE. Um, my company was acquired uh, by GE, and we're very excited about it because of GE's commitment to the digital, uh, the, the digital industrial, and taking the power industry, and I mean the whole power industry, into this digital age based on their Predix platform. GE Power Digital is the first of the uh, GE lines of business to uh, work on the Predix platform and to be formed as a separate unit. When GE purchased Alstom, we were partnered with Alstom, uh, and uh, together the, the, the three entities are bringing Alstom's uh, uh, legacy, Alstom, GE's uh, expertise in the coal part of the power industry into the Predix platform. Uh, this gives GE a position in uh, the primary mover of all of the segments of the power industry and really uh, creates a very strong position to leverage uh, innovative technologies uh, like what we have developed and are bringing to the Predix platform. Uh, if, why, if you think, you know, why is GE committed to coal and you only lived in the U.S. market, uh, that would be a question. It seems like coal is shrinking, but globally, coal is growing. Uh, coal is going to be an essential part of the mix uh, with all the uh, opportunity that it brings to electrify uh, emerging markets and some of the environmental challenges that it brings. Um, those are both local, like NOx that we've been dealing with forever, and global, like CO2, uh, which is uh, getting to be more important for everyone. But those challenges and those opportunities are there globally in a very strong way, and uh, GE is positioned versus all of these um, different generating sources. Uh, that being said, uh, in the U.S., um, the number of coal units that are available uh, still standing, uh, is, is shrinking. Uh, it's small and it's shrinking, and that's due to a 
unique set of circumstances around strong environmental regulation, driving up costs, but also, and probably more fundamentally, the cost of gas, which seems to be uh, unique to our market. Um, but there's a lot of pressure that is being put on the uh, coal-installed uh, base. So um, when we look at the pressures on the industry, we're at a point now where coal and combined cycle assets, both of which were designed to, base, to, to run baseload, are competing for that baseload generation. That's, that's a situation that has been around for a few years now, but was really not heard of for a long time in the industry. So that drives a focus on efficiency to try to get into dispatch. Uh, the fact that we're now introducing a large amount of uh, renewables, that being primarily solar and wind, into the market puts a new role on the coal base in that these uh, units, which were, again, designed to baseload, are now providing grid stability and responding to intermittent demand, which is, by mandate, uh, gets first access to the grid. And so there's a greater need for flexibility in the fleet. Uh, finally, environmental drivers, as we've talked about, are focusing uh, the industry on emissions. The most recent uh, action was the MATS rule, but we have CASPER coming back. We've had NOx regulations for a while. These are obligations that uh, coal, generations, uh, coal generators uh, need to meet, uh, and they sort of uh, just ratchet up the pressure on the industry to uh, improve performance. So one of the things that uh, differentiates coal from other sources of uh, electricity is the complexity of the operation, and that really drives back to fuel variability. Uh, we're, we're, we're burning a rock, and the rock's been in the ground for millions of years. It has different chemical compositions, sometimes even within seams of coal. Uh, all coal uh, imposes a burden on the process of turning it into a fine powder that can be burned efficiently. Um, that drives uh, significant changes, uh, significant differences in this asset base as compared to a combined cycle plant. There's five times the equipment in a, plant, in a coal plant compared to a uh, combined cycle plant. Uh, there are 10,000 data points in a coal plant that can be that are interrelated, that can be uh, analyzed, and action can be taken on taken based on the data that's coming to you. So we have looked at this uh, challenge really as a big data problem in the coal plant, as a, a big data mach machine, and the ability to respond and the amount of data to respond to is just sort of a custom-made um, environment for. Uh, artificial intelligence, and that's what we bring. Uh, what we bring to the table in taking this this asset and making it better, uh, and also uh, making it available to uh, the Predix platform. So, if you look at the GE Power Digital Solution Map, there is business operation. That's cloud-based analytics to leverage the vast amount of data that's uh, out there in existing fleets and existing assets uh, to make better decisions. Um, one level down from that, um, you will see plant optimization. And with plant optimization, there are really four uh, important pieces, five important pieces, and what our primary message is built around is efficiency and emissions. We can do uh, a, a very good job in responding to all the data that the, that the power plant produces and all the control options that are there. We have uh, strong uh, value stories around flexibility and availability. Uh, and what we're essentially able to do is take this asset, improve its performance, expand its operating window, and then provide that representation back out to uh, the GE uh, Predix platform and all the applications built on it. Uh, optimization is about trade-offs. Uh, all the drivers that we talked about are imposing new uh, new trade-offs to be made with plant life, uh, you know, estimated plant life changing. How much uh, are you willing to pay more to get a market opportunity today in terms of long-term equipment life? You need to be able to ask those questions. Mine the, mine the asset itself to find out everything you can about the answer and then draw your uh, own conclusions and make your own priorities. We believe that we help, uh, that we help to do that. So, uh, Key to the GE message is the digital twin. All of the analytics in the cl cloud are going to run based on a digital representation of the real assets in the field to catch opportunities, catch anomalous behavior, catch, uh, catch, catch emerging risks. And key to that digital twin is what Nuco brought to the table, which is boiler optimization. 
So we make an application that actually sits on-premise and interfaces with the control system. So largely for um, that NERC SIP uh, concern, we are on-premise. We uh, do not have cloud-based software that is interfacing with the control system. When we look at the two core processes that really determine um, you know, how much value you're creating or destroying uh, in a coal plant, that being fuel and air distribution, which is what we call combustion optimization, and soot cleaning, which we call soot optimization. So fuel and air, we look at about 40 things. Some of them move really fast. Some of them move slowly. Uh, we, we have about, uh, of those 40 variables, probably five move every 10 to 20 seconds, and the rest will move every 12 to 15 minutes. These are dampers, mill speeds, O2 levels, uh, differential pressure. Those are the things that we're trying to capture to make sure you get a clean and even burn of your fuel so you're getting as much energy out of it as you can uh, while at the same time minimizing your emissions. One of the things we optimize is CO, and we can do a very good job of it. If you have CO under control, you don't build up as much slag. Which brings me to the soot op side of the equation. When you're optimizing soot, you're trying to manage those 50 or 200 or 250 uh, soot blowing, uh, uh, soot -blowing uh, controllables that you have inside the furnace and the back pass most of which operate based on putting water uh, inside the furnace, which can be a very bad thing to do if the tube is already clean. So we shift to a paradigm where we're responding to actual conditions in the boiler to direct soot blowing. We abandon sequences, uh, and we take over uh, firing of individual uh, soot blowers. So that, that, that core understanding uh, feeds the basis for the value that we create with customers, as Kelly is going to talk about today, and it, and it, feeds, uh, it, it creates the basis for the digital twin that will populate the um, Predix cloud-based analytics. So I'd like to introduce uh, Kelly. We've been working with Kelly for about six years now. Uh, the Jeffrey Energy Center is the biggest coal plant in Kansas. Um, we have boiler optimization, as I just described, on all three of the units. Uh, and we've helped uh, the plant to respond to some new challenges. Uh, the 2010 consent decree uh, uh, required optimization, um, but also some of the more historical uh, um, concerns that the plant has had due to some issues around plant design. Um, it's had slagging and fouling problems. These are things that we can also address. Uh, and so Kelly has been a great uh, customer and a great collaborator, and uh, I'd like to hand it off to her now so that uh, she can talk you through the real experience with the product at her plant. All right, thanks, Peter. Uh, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about our boiler optimization and NOx reduction project at Jeffrey Energy Center. Um, as Peter said, we've been uh, on this journey for about six years now, and uh, we've learned a lot of things along the way. So to start out with a little more background about our units, uh, Jeffrey Energy Center uh, is located in St. Mary's, Kansas. Uh, we have three sister units. They are eight-corner tangentially fired units. Uh, they were originally designed for PRB coal, uh, which you'll notice by the uh, commissioning timeline. They were some of the earlier units designed for PRB coal, and as such, they were still slightly undersized uh, for a conventional PRB unit. Um, that uh, resulted in a, a very high net input, net heat input per plant area, um, as well as contributed to our history of flagging and fouling problems. Um, in our history, we've typically seen um, a strategy where we were derating the units every third night. So each unit would come down for uh, a cleaning derate um, every third night to uh, try to shed flag, um, and on top of that, we had frequent uh, cleaning outages to try to manage that. Um, additionally, we are dispatched as part of the Southwest Power Pool um, as part of their day ahead market. Uh, so over the last few years, as, as that marketing scheme has developed, um, you know, we found that we have uh, less predictability and less control over our own dispatching. Um, so those contributors, contributors from, from wind and uh, natural gas uh, that Peter alluded to uh, really make it necessary for us to be as flexible as possible in our operation. 
Um, you know, it's not just a uh, typical uh, base-loaded unit anymore. So the overall project uh, for NOx reduction at Jeffrey uh, really started in 2010 with a consent decree. Um, we were, as part of that consent decree, required to install one SCR, um, and we selected Unit 1 uh, to have that SCR on it. And then we were given the option to either build a second SDR or comply with a site-wide 30-day uh, NOx limit of 0.1 pounds per million BTU. Um, we really wanted to avoid the second SDR uh, uh, due to, uh, obviously, the upfront capital costs and operating costs of an SDR, um, as well as the um, ongoing operational challenges that an SCR uh, presents um, as far as uh, temperature and load limitations and things of that nature. Uh, so we decided to take a little bit different approach to see if we could um, avoid that second SCR. Um, and what we did was stack several different technologies to be able to achieve our site-wide NOx limit. Um, that included boiler modifications on units two and three. Um, to add additional elevations of overfire air. Uh, we call those our TOFAs. Um, we also upgraded uh, several elevations of our burners to a newer style of low NOx burners that uses horizontally biased combustion to reduce NOx. Um, additionally, we installed SNCRs on both units two and three. And uh, finally, what we're going to focus in on today, um, we installed the uh, combustion and sibling optimizers, um, or what's known as NUCO's boiler ops package, on all three of our units. So our overall performance objectives when we went into this project, obviously we needed to reduce NOx. So uh, to achieve our site-wide limit, unit one with the SCR had a target of 0.04 pounds per million BTU on a 30-day rolling average. Um, and units two and three then needed to be able to maintain 30-day averages of, of approximately 0.115 pounds per million BTU. Um, on top of that, though, we have CO limits that we needed to comply with. Um, anybody with any boiler tuning experience knows that uh, if you're reducing NOx, you're almost always increasing CO, so that balancing act was very important. Um, we also wanted to uh, take this opportunity to try to address some of our boiler slagging and fouling issues. Um, we wanted to uh, ensure that we were uh, maintaining our fly ash saleability and managing the amount of LOI in our fly ash. And we also wanted to see if we could uh, not just uh, you know, avoid a performance degradation in the boiler, but actually improve it. Um, so we wanted to focus on things like steam temperatures, uh, the temperator sprays, uh, particularly the reheat sprays, which have a, a big impact on, on heat rate, as well as our exit gas temperatures in the boiler. So if you're looking at this project, you might be asking, why include optimizers when you're already doing all the things with uh, boiler modifications and adding back-end equipment? Well, we wanted to include optimizers because we have over 200 pneumatic actuators per unit um, for, for all of our dampers and tilts and yaws and various controls. Um, so that's just too many things. It's unrealistic to expect operators to be able to, uh, to manipulate each one of those um, and, and know what the effect is going to be, um, you know, depending on um, conditions at that time, whether it's unit load or even the weather or the cold quality, uh, the reaction of a given damper is not always going to be the same. Um, and on top of that, the, the operator has the whole rest of the unit to run. You know, they can't spend their, they can't spend their entire shift focusing just on, on NOx. Um, so we needed uh, some, needed the optimizers that would be able to take that out of the operator's hands and focus on that for us. Um, Additionally, we found we had a lot of inconsistent strategies among operators, so not just for NOx, but uh, you see, we saw this especially uh, with SIP blowing, that uh, each operator had their, their favorite techniques, um, favorite sequences they liked to run, um, or if they were blowing manually, how they liked to, liked to operate the unit. Um, and uh, that made it very difficult for us to uh, plan you know, how we were going to um, 
you know, tackle any of these challenges for, for NOS or CO or performance uh, because it would vary depending on who was sitting at the control board that day. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we were getting the most out of all of the information that we were already collecting around the plant. Uh, so, you know, we'd already invested in having, uh, you know, these actuators that we could control from the control room um, and all the instrumentation, you know, temperatures and pressures and, and things that we were measuring. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a, a sense that uh, we weren't getting as much benefit out of that as we could um, and that, uh, you know, a software program is, is best suited to doing that for us. Um, but probably the main thing, um, the main reason why we included optimizers is the need to maintain our performance gains over the long term. So, you know, we spent all this money uh, upgrading the, the boilers, adding the TOGVAs, um, the SNCRs and SCR, um, but it, it doesn't, uh, doesn't mean anything ultimately if you can't maintain that, uh, you know, for years down the road, um, you know, no matter what uh, different uh, conditions you throw at it. So the optimizers uh, were our way of trying to give us that flexibility that we needed. Uh, so when we got into the uh, uh, setup of the, the optimizers um, for the combustion side, uh, we set, uh, set up several controlled variables that we were trying to trying to <clears throat> trying to maximize here. So um, obviously we wanted to reduce NOx. Um, we wanted to keep CO in check. Um, we also wanted to balance our O2, um, so our, our profile across the, the uh, boiler exit. Uh, that was one way of um, obviously improving NOx and CO, but uh, also was going to be a key for us in uh, addressing some of our slagging and fouling issues. Um, and then for the performance side, we also have it uh, monitoring the uh, superheat steam temperatures and reheat steam temperatures to try to keep them as close to their set points as possible. And we're achieving all those things uh, by manipulating a lot of different variables on the boiler. Uh, so first we have the, the MPC variables or the predictive control variables. Those are the things that Pierre talked about that we want to have a very quick response on. Um, so those are things like the O2 trim for, um, for controlling CO um, or the master burner tilt, so the, the two halves of the furnace. Uh, so that you could respond quickly to changes in steam temperature. And then we have the, the neural net variables that uh, will respond a little bit uh, more slowly um, uh, to try to optimize the process. So those are things like your coal feeders, uh, your fuel air dampers, sofa dampers, tilts and yaws, um, with the ability to uh, bias between the, the two furnace halves um, on your, your copas and sofas. Um, we have the burner tilts for each individual corner to give you a little bit um, uh, finer control uh, than the master burner tilts for each half. Um, we also have the boundary air yaw biases, um, LFSB tilt, um, and then on units two and three, after the boiler upgrades, we added in the uh, Topher, TOFA dampers, tilts, and yaws as well. Uh, for the, uh, the soot off side, um, you know, we have over, well over 100 uh, different soot blowers um, across the, the boiler that we're trying to control. So everything from wall blowers in the furnace, we track from the backpack and our uh, rotary air heater blowers. Um, what we really wanted to accomplish with, with soot off was getting away from our time-based cleaning um, scheme that uh, Peter talked about, where you're just running a, a sequence um, that, uh, you know, was possibly you know, set up um, for a specific set of conditions that may or may not be true at any given time. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we wanted to shift towards a more condition-based clean. We're looking at things like our reheat steam temperatures, our superheat steam temperatures, uh, the exit gas temperatures uh, from the boiler, um, our uh, a temperator spray, so especially those reheat sprays that are going to really affect uh, your unit heat rate. And uh, you know, make sure that we're only blowing when we need to, and that uh, we're we're blowing where we need to. So taking a more targeted approach. Um, so now for some of our results. Um, so this slide shows you some of Unit Three's NOx results. So going back to the very beginning of the the project in uh, 2011 um, and through 2013. 
Uh, so we started out. Um, you see the, uh, the the red line is our our 30 day NOx, and then the blue line um, is the 30 uh, day capacity factor. Uh, so we started out with uh, our 30 day NOx um, up around the 0.2 range, um, and uh, after some you know initial loan opportunity, we were able to uh, reduce that substantially. Um, and then once we brought uh, the boiler out system. Uh, online, we were able to to maintain and continue improving our NOx. Um, then in uh, the uh, spring and summer of uh, 2012, when we uh, completed the, the boiler modifications and uh, the SNCR installation, um, you can see we took another step down in, in NOx. Um, and then uh, late in uh, 2012 and into early 2013, uh, we recommissioned Boiler Ops, uh, you know, had it retrained to address our uh, boiler changes that we had made. And uh, you can see that even though our capacity factors were at some of the highest that we've seen them in the time period, um, our NOx was uh, among the lowest of the time period. And this is the same kind of snapshot for Unit 2's NOx results. Uh, so you can see that uh, we had the outage to uh, upgrade the, the boiler and uh, incorporate the SNCR, um, and you get uh, some good uh, step downs and knocks from from those steps. And then once the uh, boiler out was brought back on um, and incorporated all those changes, um, then we continued to see improvements and knocks after that. Um, but, you know, like I said, that doesn't mean much unless you can maintain it. So looking at our current NOx performance across our, our load range, you know, over two years later now, and you can see that uh, our, our performance is still better when uh, when we're using combustion ops compared to times when we're not. Um, so across the whole load range, uh, you can see that uh, our NOx is lower on, on all the units. Uh, you know, unit one, you're looking at the... Uh, inlet NOx to our SCR, so um, uh, the fact that uh, that inlet NOx is lower means that uh, we're able to reduce our, our ammonia usage and consumption um, and, uh, you know, get a benefit there. And then uh, you'll notice that uh, units 2 and 3 have the same kind of trend um, with lower NOx when we're using the optimizers. Um, and you can also see that, that unit 2 um, has... Uh, <laughs> Than, uh, than doing better knocks than uh, Unit 3 due to um, some Hello? improvements in the TOFA design we were able to make. So then our uh, SODOX results. Um, you know, historically, we have had a lot of challenges with sagging steam temperatures at full load. And uh, uh, SODOC really helped us address some of those problems. Um, you know, it's never going to solve the problem completely. Part of that is just a uh, boiler design issue. Um, but it helped us make up ground um, on those superheat temperatures that we that we see sag off at full load. So helped us uh, improve our efficiency there by maintaining those temperatures um, better than we than we could without. Um, at the same time, we wanted to tackle our uh, temperator sprays, particularly on the on the reheat side, uh, where you really take the the efficiency hit. Um, and so we were able to adjust um, our slip blowing strategies to reduce those those reheat sprays um, uh, on all three units, uh, which is a big benefit for us. And then. Finally, on set off, we also were able to uh, reduce the air heater inlet temperatures. Um, so that's uh, helpful because it not only shows that uh, you know, we're keeping the overall boiler uh, cleaner, um, but when you combine it with the, the previous two slides, it tells you that we're keeping the, the boiler uh, cleaner where we need it. So where we need that heat transfer, we're improving it there, um, uh, but without keeping it too clean in other areas that would actually negatively affect our performance. Um, 
And I, I should say that uh, you know all these results for for sit ops. Um, you know, one of the additional benefits is that they were achieved without um, without increasing um, our SIP loading. In fact, we were able to reduce our, our SIP loading, you know, the number of operations uh, quite significantly by about 20% or so on average across the three units. Um, so that's just a, a reduction in erosion and other problems that you'd see from uh, that compressed air usage. Um, some of the other things uh, that we've done with the, the product uh, that found, and we found useful um, over the years is uh, uh, controlling SDR inlet temperatures. Uh, so, you know, it's very common for uh, units with SDRs to have issues uh, on the, the lower end um, of the temperature range uh, where you have a minimum temperature allowed um, before you start having concerns about ABS formation. Um, and we do have that issue, but uh, we have a kind of a double whammy where we also, um, since our unit runs very hot, uh, we will um, run into a maximum temperature limit on our SDR as well, uh, where uh, we have the potential to, to damage the catalyst that way. Uh, so being able to control the SDR temperatures on both ends um, to eliminate D rates uh, it's really been uh, an important thing for us over the last year or so. Um, so that includes things like learning how to blow such strategically depending on, on what load you're running at um, and what the SCR inlet temperature is. Um, also adjusting burner tilts, controlling the overfire air, um, and even biasing feeders. So um, you know, having the uh, upper feeders bias down at uh, higher loads to reduce the amount of heat that's getting carried into the backpack uh, compared to at lower loads, then you want to bias up those upper feeders to keep as much heat um, going into the SDR as possible. Um, we've also found use with uh, uh, using the, the optimizers to um, address some of our ID fan limitation issues on units two and three. So we have um, been ID fan limited on those two units in the summer during the, the hottest part of the year um, where we run out of ID fan capacity. And historically, our operators would manually bias down excess O2 uh, to try to get a, get a few more megawatts out of the unit. Um, and that's fine for a while, but if you get too carried away with that, um, then we just exacerbate the uh, flagging and fouling issues of the unit. Uh, so we were able to uh, use combustion ops to try to uh, uh, walk that line down the middle where, we'll, where we're, we are able to reduce the excess O2 uh, to a certain extent to uh, get those extra few megawatts on the hot days, um, but, not, uh, but we're able to combine that with looking at our CO so that we know that we're not pushing it too far uh, where it's just going to hurt us down the road. Um, another feature, um, that uh, we, we've used with this product uh, is the automatic email reports and notifications. Um, the one thing we have is a daily overview report. Um, so I get every morning that uh, gives me a snapshot um, of how the units are all operating. So it shows me the basic things, you know, how Knox did over the pe previous 24 hours, um, you know, how our, how our boiler performance looked over the previous 24 hours. Uh, so at a glance, I can uh, tell what, uh, what we might need to focus on uh, for the upcoming day, you know, whether there's any problems that need to be addressed. Um, additionally, we have a uh, weekly sublower health report. Um, you know, one of our big challenges when we started was the reliability of the operation of those sublowers. You, know, you can't optimize the process if the, if the sublowers aren't running reliably. Uh, so getting these, these weekly reports that uh, show us what what is, what is running correctly and what isn't allows us to uh, work with our maintenance personnel uh, to target uh, soap loaders for repairs um, in those high impact areas where we really need them. And then finally, we also have uh, automatic alerts when uh, we have a NOx or a CO excursion. Uh, so if for whatever reason, um, you know, something's, something's going wrong and uh, NOx and CO are higher than the models predict it to be, uh, then we will, then I'll get an automatic notification and I'm able to 
uh, look into it and uh, start diagnosing the issue right away um, rather than getting a surprise on our 30-day average after, you know, we've had an issue for several days in a row. Um, so those are some of the, some of the other applications that uh, we've been able to experiment with over the years. So through this whole um, process, you know, we've learned a lot of different things about, um, about boiler optimization. Um, you know, one of the things is, you know, that using these, these software programs, you know, they, they really have uh, shown the ability to uh, not only improve our NOx, but to maintain it over the long term, um, and that uh, we didn't have to sacrifice boiler performance in order to get it. Um, the other, one of the things that we uh, found pretty early on is that uh, you really need to get input from the operators and get their buy-in if you want to have success with this. Um, so um, initially, a lot of operators viewed some of these programs as taking control out of their hands, um, you know, and that, that wasn't something that they, that they liked. But once they uh, got more comfortable with the programs and saw what it was able to do for them, you know, that it was able to make their jobs easier, um, then that was, um, you know, a, a key turning point in getting them to to use the system and uh, keep it on and let it do its job. Um, the, the next bullet point, you know, it, it sounds really obvious and it is, um, but uh, it, it, you'd be surprised at uh, how many places uh, falter on this point. Um, you know, the the results of the of the software, they're only going to be as good as the data that goes in. So having a, a really good program to make sure that your instruments are calibrated um, or that, you know, like we talked about the SIP lowers, that they're operating reliably and, and available for service, um, you know, those are the kind of things that need to happen before you're going to get these kinds of benefits. Um, and finally, you know, these types of optimizers are never going to be a system where you're able to, um, you know, just install it and walk away. Um, you know, you really need somebody on the plant side, um, you know, working with um, NUCO or now GE to uh, continue monitoring the, the program, um, seeing what's working well and what isn't, and addressing issues and continuing to improve things. So what's next for us? Um, you know, we're still moving forward uh, with trying to continuing to continue to improve our systems. Um, a couple of things that, that we're working on um, for the soot op side uh, is coordinating our soot blowing among all three units. Um, you know, we were, we were able to see a lot of benefit up front from the initial reductions in soot blowing by taking a more targeted approach. Um, but the three units didn't communicate among each other. Uh, so you would see times when all three were t trying to sub low at the same time and you'd get a sharp peak in demand, uh, you know, that would ha require a, an extra compressor to be on um, to be able to handle that uptick. But uh, uh, now we've uh, adjusted some of the networking and uh, we're able to communicate among the three units. So we're, we're going to start trying to coordinate that sub blowing uh, to eliminate those peaks in demand. Um, and if we can, can do that, so we have the potential to be able to shut off a very large compressor. Uh, it's not only a, a big aux power draw for us, um, but it's also a big heat load on our cooling system. So we get a lot of benefit um, if we're able to achieve that. Um, another thing we're looking at on the uh, combustion off side is improving our low load performance. Um, so we've already made a lot of great strides in that um, over the last few years, and not only our steady state low load, but also our performance while ramping the unit up and down in response to market conditions. Um, but with uh, more and more wind in the system, um, you know, we're continually being asked to try to improve our unit turndown. Um, so we set a fairly ambitious goal for ourselves of trying to sustain 200 megawatts growth uh, per unit um, as our low load. And one of the ch big challenges to being able to sustain that is actually our NOx. Um, because you get into such a um, uh, a high airflow scenario at, at lower load, um, you just have so much excess O2 at that point. Uh, so trying to balance the NOx at, at low load is going to be key to key to be being able to achieve that that 200 megawatt goal.
All right, so that uh, essentially wraps up my section of the, the presentation. Um, I will uh, hand it back over to uh, Peter here to, to finish up, and uh, then we'll be happy to uh, take some questions. Sure. <clears throat> Kelly, uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, I think you took a limited amount of time and gave a, a, a pretty comprehensive view, you know, not only of the project that you uh, executed, but how we really work together and continue to work together to, to try to get more out of the system. Um, when we look at uh, plant optimization outcomes in general, uh, we keep in mind that every plant will have its own objectives. Uh, we have uh, another customer uh, not not far from where you are, Kelly, and he just makes sure our system is on. That's his interaction with the system. But uh, he's got an emissions goal. He's got a heat rate goal, um, and he's got a CO permit. And so we have worked with him uh, to get that set up. Well, it's somewhat, uh, it makes it a little difficult to extrapolate to general benefits, but what we see typically in terms of efficiency uh, it's half percent to a percent uh, uh, increase in boiler efficiency, uh, and 20 to 30 percent reductions in soot blowing. Uh, that's a very significant number because those two together mean that you're really probably not putting water-based media on tubes that are <coughs> clean already. <coughs> um, in terms of emissions, uh, we reduce NOx. Our, our number is 10 to 15 percent. We think that's a, that's a doable number for the optimizer, and that's reflected in our experience. Uh, and finally, if you take uh, that top bullet and you sort of turn it on its head, if you're not eroding your pipes, you're not going to have as many unplanned outages, and that's something that we see consistently uh, when we install boiler opt. I'm going to try to go through this quickly so that we can get to some questions. Um, so we're bringing uh, you know, 15 years of experience with closed loop optimization, and we're putting it into the most, uh, the most comprehensive and deepest uh, industrial Internet of Things uh, platform that there is. We think that's a, a very um, uh, powerful combination, and when it further leverages the expertise that uh, the Alstom acquisition brought to GE, we think we have something uh, that's really valuable and scalable and, and, and uh, going to have a long life uh, with the, the GE uh, go forward. So uh, please feel free to contact us. We know every plant is different uh, and every objective set is going to be different, but I hope one of the things you take away from this presentation is that we have a, uh, a flexible tool that can really uh, do a lot to, to, to bring your plant's performance forward. Uh, and with that, I'd like to open it up to questions. Yeah, thank you uh, both very much for your uh, extremely informative presentation. Uh, we have had a number of questions come in from the audience during the course of the program. So we're going to try to consolidate similar questions and answer as many as possible with the time we have remaining. Uh, and for those questions that we are not able to answer because we have had a, a steady flow of questions throughout the presentation, uh, we will uh, do our best to answer individually by email following the program. So to kick things off, first question I have is, uh, if we have boiler tuning done on our units, why would we need software that optimizes the boiler? Maybe I can take a first crack at that, and then, and Kelly, you can give your perspective from the plant. Um, boiler tuners are able to get uh, a, a plant that's operating at a given load or range of loads uh, with a given fuel uh, to a very, very good level of performance. Um, what happens over time is that the plant will stray from that. That's why you need to do subsequent tunings. And what the optimizer does is it just manipulates uh, the variables that you give it to keep it at the best level of performance possible. So if the, uh, whether it's efficiency or it's um, emissions, um, you know, six months after the tuning, uh, you'll be in a better place because you've got the optimizer always kind of trying to nudge you out of the key, always always working uh, to try to keep you at that top level of performance. And Kelly, I don't know if you uh, can fill in any more about how you see uh, boiler tuning and uh, closed loop optimization relating to each other. Sure. Um you know, we, we do still use boiler tuning on our units, um, and that's actually where we started with this, this whole uh, process was having some intensive boiler tuning done. Um, but uh, like, like Peter said, um, if you're going to maintain that over any extended period of time, 
um, you know, you need the you need something that's always looking at uh, the the current conditions of the boiler because um, naturally the thing, things are going to change. Um, so whether that's your your cold quality um, that, that changes, or perhaps uh, you know you you have a coal mill that uh, you know it, its fineness uh, starts slipping a little bit, um, or you know any number of things that uh, just start to uh, drift a little bit with the unit. Um, you know the, the optimizers, you know, constantly being uh, you know re retrained so that uh, the uh, models reflect the the most recent information, the most recent data of how the the unit is operating. Um, so it's able to maintain that performance level that you get from for boiler tuning for a lot longer period than you would otherwise. Um, I'll just uh, throw in an, an extra benefit um, of it now uh, for for any units that are uh, subject to max uh, boiler tuning requirements, um, uh, you know, with the uh, optimizers, that that benefit that they provide is is recognized in that uh, that regulation. Um, so you can extend the time between uh, required uh, boiler inspections and uh, boiler tuning um, if you're using an operator using an optimizer. Um, uh, so you can go from having to uh, have your boiler tuned every year to extend that out to every 48 months, uh, which is a, a big benefit for us because obviously having comprehensive boiler tuning um, done on a unit, um, while it's very useful, it's also uh, fairly expensive. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, that's a, that's a general benefit that we uh, bring in the in the U.S. market in terms of compliance with the uh, with the match rule, we also feel it, it somewhat limits the the risk associated with um, how much data needs to be retained. But that's clearly uh, something that uh, each utility needs to look at and be and be comfortable with themselves. Great, thank you both. And yeah, just a reminder for everyone in the audience: keep uh, filling in questions uh, as we uh, round out the presentation here. I'm going to keep uh, plugging away. Next question, uh, Kelly, you actually alluded to it in uh, in your answer to the last question. Uh, this uh, question is: My coal uh, fuel is very variable. How do you accommodate for this? Yeah, so um, we are relatively fortunate um, that our, our coal quality is, is fairly consistent as far as it goes. You know, we're we're coaling, um, uh, you know, Eagle Butte coal, um, so it's uh, uh, largely largely similar. But uh, you know, when we do get uh, an occasional uh, train from a, a poor seam or a poor uh, portion of a seam. Um, you can see that the, the the benefit of the the optimizer, um, you know, reacting to that. Um, so it's it's designed with a enough flexibility, um, you know, that it can uh, you know see that uh, you know, you've got a, a change in temperatures or something re, uh, uh, from that uh, change in, in cold quality, um, and it'll react accordingly. Um, I think our biggest benefit from it has been. Um, on the on the soot off side, uh, so if we get uh, a, a train of coal that uh, has <coughs> um, characteristics that would usually cause a lot of flagging in our units, um, you know we know that because it's doing condition based soot blowing, um, that it's going to automatically ramp up the amount of of cleaning that it's doing um, while that train is being burned, um, you know without needing a lot of our intervention. Um, that's especially good, you know, when uh, um, the the mine maybe uh, uh, doesn't uh, accurately predict when a when a train is going to be arriving, and we end up uh, burning uh, that coal uh, a lot sooner or a lot later than uh, we had uh, predicted. So having it automatically take control and not having to count on um, you know an operator tracking you know what what coal they're burning when um, and responding to it themselves um, is, is really useful. Yeah, I would just uh, augment that maybe by getting a little uh, nerdy. But um, if if you have had experience years ago with an optimizer, most likely that was a pure neural optimizer. Um, and pure neural um, has some issues. Uh, it takes a neural model a while to learn. So when coal changes, 
uh, the neural model has to step back and learn again and ends up therefore spending less time actually optimizing. <clears throat> That's a legitimate knock on a pure neural system. Um, we took we, we were very fortunate to get almost forty million dollars in in uh, DOE money, and it's how we were able to, um, to to build the platform that we have here. So it gave us many more tools to deal with issues like that. So the fuel issue is kind of like a mill issue, but if we we will set up the system to look for things like changes in mill amps, changes in detected sulfur, changes in certain temperatures. And the model will, the optimizer will then associate that with uh, a certain fuel, and it will use the neural models that were last used uh, when that operating condition was encountered. So we don't say that we have a fuel quality analyzer. We don't. But we have a way to figure out when the fuel has changed and then to respond best to it. And that's a lot like mills in that if you have uh, four mills on a, on a boiler, uh, it's going to behave differently when it's A, B, and C mills that are being used versus A, B, and D. Uh, and we d use the same uh, technique. We just take that into account, and we, um, we use, go to our library models and use, that, uh, use the models that were best suited at that time. Great. Next question, maybe uh, best suited for you, Kelly. What setting was used for the O2 trim? Yeah, so historically our XSO2 was set off a simple curve in the, the DCS, so um, it would uh, adjust based on based on load. Um, and then in the uh, uh, combustion op side, we, were, we gave it the ability um, to, to bias um, that O2 set point, um, typically by about plus or minus 0.4%. Uh, um, and the, uh, the main two things it's looking at when it's doing that are um, CO. Um, so that's something, you know, since CO is so, so volatile, um, you know, we need the, the ability for um, the O2 trim to respond, um, you know, really quickly to, to changes in CO for us. Um, and then the other one, you know, being NOx. So, um, you know, you'll typically see the O2, the way it's set up now, um, it will often be biased down um, to try to minimize NOx, um, except for times when we get the high CO, um, and then you'll see that O2 bias uh, start to come up. Um, so uh, that kind of gives us the, the best of both both worlds, um, you know, as the, as the units are... Um, you know, typically currently tuned, um, you know, we, we typically have fairly consistent CO except during times when we're really ramping up and down a lot. Um, so, so that's where you'll see that, that O2 bias, um, you know, kick in and, and start uh, controlling the CO uh, when load is changing. Um, as far as, you know, what the, the set points are, um, on, on our units, uh, we would typically run at... Uh, Full load, um, our XSO2 would be about oh 2.8 percent or so, um, and then uh, it'll increase at at lower loads up to about six percent. Great, thanks, Kelly. Next question here: Please discuss air heater fouling. Any changes due to program changes from 2010? Um, no, our air heater um, fouling hasn't really uh, been any issue. Um, that's actually, um, you know, kind of a, an interesting uh, discussion point and something that we'll probably need to revisit in the future. Um, historically, you know, we've done a fair amount of testing um, on our on our subloin in the in the air heater. And what we found was that uh, there was very little benefit in blowing more frequently than once an hour on the air heater. Um, and uh, so the, when we optimized that, uh, we basically kept it at a one-hour timer. Um, but what we did was stagger this the blowing among the three units. So it was based on, based on an hour but on clock time so that you were never 
um, blowing on all three units simultaneously. So that was one way we were able to reduce our compressed air usage um, at that time. Um, now we've actually started um, upgrading our air heater baskets and the, uh, the blowers for them. Um, so we've got new ones on Unit 3 and are currently installing uh, new air heater baskets on Unit 2, and uh, Unit 1 will follow next year. Uh, so that will be a, um, an ongoing question of whether we can uh, you know, reduce that, that supply and optimize that uh, further on the air heater basket um, to address any issues. Um, but uh, as far as, you know, air heater plugage, um, you know, especially anything, you know, from the, from the SDR, um, you know, I know a lot of places have issues with, with ABS uh, buildup on their air heaters. Um, you know, we haven't had uh, any of those issues. Uh, you know, since we've we've added any of these any of the new equipment or the optimizers, um, but but certainly you know we would have the the ability to address those if needed. Yeah, and this is Peter Kirk. I don't know who asked that question, but certainly other of our customers have had uh, real issues around that, and I think that uh, we've been able to help them out a lot with that. Uh, with the you know, integration of fuel air, and uh, particularly in this case, I think the soot optimizer. Um, if we, you wanted to follow up uh, with an offline conversation, that would be great. Great. we got time for one more question, and then uh, we'll wrap the program. So last question is, if burners can't be tilted, what else we can adjust to control the SCR temperature? Yeah, sure. So if uh, you aren't uh, uh, able to tilt your burners, um, some of the other things that we've done um, are adjust how much overfire air you're using. Uh, so by um, either opening up the uh, sofa dampers further to uh, put a little more heat in the top of the furnace, or closing them down to uh, reduce the amount of heat in the top of the furnace. Um, you know, you can move your SDR inlet temperature um, up or down uh, pretty substantially. Um, you know, the only downside of that is obviously if you're adjusting your sofa dampers, you're also um, changing your uh, inlet knocks to the SCR. Um, so you do have to manage that, that trade-off a little bit if you're going that route. Um, the other thing you can do is uh, look at um, which, which mills are in service. Um, you know, so if you want to increase the temperature to your SCR, then you'd want higher mills in service. Um, and you can also look at the, the biasing of those mills. So, you know, bias up the, the, the upper mill um, to once again, you know, increase the amount of heat you're putting into the top of the furnace um, and carrying back to the SDR. Um, or conversely, if you're trying to lower the temperature, then you would do the opposite. You'd want low mills and you'd want the, the highest ones in service to be biased down. Um, so those are a few of the things. We've also done a lot with, uh, with soot blowing. So, um, you know, so when we're trying to keep the, the temperatures high, going into the SDR for low lows, um, we really back off the blowing to just the, the very minimum needed to maintain steam temperatures um, <clears throat> so that we're, you know, we're, we're carrying over as much of that, that heat into the SDR as possible. Um, and then we would do the opposite at, at full load, uh, where we'll really increase the amount of the blowing that we're doing to control temperatures, um, including a lot of extra blowing in the, in the furnace using our wall blowers uh, to, to reduce the the temperature going into the SCR. Great. Well, we have officially reached the end of the program. So uh, as mentioned before, we've had a number of other good questions uh, that, that have come in here that we're not able to get to at this point due to time uh, allowance, but we will address further questions individually by email. So thank you so much once again to, to Kelly and Peter for a great presentation, very informative. Thank you once again to GE as well for underwriting today's event. And thank you all in the audience for attending. We hope you benefit from today's presentation. Have a wonderful day. Great. Thank you so much, Kelly. Yeah, thank you.